Good morning, and um, thank you to the University of Art and Design, Linz, and especially uh, Lucas Fireis for the invitation. Uh, it's my first time in your city, and uh, it's been lovely the, the, the few hours I've been here already. Um, I would like to start by making um, a few confessions. Um, I am not Spanish, as you can tell from the accent. Um, I am not an architect. <laughs> I was trained as a city planner. And I'm new to the academic world. Um, I joined the IE School of Architecture um, in really full time just a few years ago. Um, and the final uh, confession is I'm a great advocate of the digital world and online learning. But I must confess, I bought my first cell phone in 2005, and I still have the same one. <laughs> um, today, when dealing with a complex issue such as architecture and teaching architecture, uh, it's almost like hitting, trying to hit a moving target. Uh, even those with the best aim often miss the mark. So today I would like to look at two points. Uh, how do we teach and learn? Uh, in other words, how do we teach students about space? And where do we teach and learn? Or in what spaces do we teach and learn? And clearly, uh, there are a lot of changes taking place in the profession and the uh, teaching of architecture. And I'm reminded of an article by Stan Allen, uh, the recent, uh, uh, was until very recently, dean at Princeton University. And he wrote a, a wonderful article that I recommend to you and, and also to lay people, uh, talking about three basic areas of change in the profession. One has to do with the role of the architect and architecture in society. Uh, the second is uh, the confusion or pluralism about design directions. And three is the area of technology and in turn uh, leading to globalization. So with those ideas, just as a backdrop about architecture uh, and the profession and how it's changing, uh, today I will talk about four basic points. Point number one, the architecture studio. And I would begin by making the broad statement that architectural education in some regards has not evolved as one would expect from a creative discipline. And in some ways, we're still using late 19th and early 20th century models for teaching and learning. Um, Academically, of course, the studio is different than many other traditional classes in the, uh, in the university. And it's one that we can say is taught through the coaching methodology. It's learning by doing. Um, of course, there are no exams, there are no graded papers, there are no library assignments. Um, and often a, an instructor, as you all know, has 10 to 15 students or more, and um, it's problem-based. People work on different projects. Um, the school may have a set of models, and students work at home or at school, producing um, the results of their, uh, their ideas in terms of paper or building models or sometimes building the real object. Um, the other aspect, of course, of um, architectural studios is the, the crit, the architectural crit or the jury. And this often comes towards maybe midterm, but towards the end of the process. And while without a doubt the architectural crit or the jury has uh, positive value, if we look at one uh, study mm, that came out of New Zealand last year talking about redesigning the design crit, it found that the traditional format of the jury with a student in front of a panel of judges produced anxiety 
before and during the crit in about 45% of the students. Um, so the other complaints about this are that the student is unable at times to take full advantage of the feedback due to the heightened atmosphere of the crit. It privileges the professional acculturation over student learning. There's asymmetry between power between the student and the staff. And then, of course, anxiety. Uh, point number two, formal versus informal learning. In the university, we see trends often as uh, in speaking about informal uh, spaces for learning as uh, the way to go for the future. The popular idea, and I would guess, I would even state the common sense idea, is that more informal spaces are needed and when you create informal spaces, a prescribed behavior will occur. And the rise of formal spaces has led to uh, uh, new words and new vocabularies. If we, look at, uh, if we look at formal spaces, of course, the emphasis is all eyes focusing on one professor, the concept of students as recipients recipients of knowledge, recipients of information. If we look at informal learning, it's supposed to be active, learning from each other, a time for discovery, uh, includes spontaneity and be participatory. And those new metaphors or new, new words uh, that have come into our vocabulary talk about learning at places such as the hub, or having docking stations rather than offices or desks, uh, the clusters, using sofas, bean bags, places with lots of color, etc., etc. However, when we look at this, we also must remember that while we, well, um, the popular idea is that space can um, create or can provoke behavior. Studies have found that usually the best it can do is to uh, permit it, but not guarantee it. So therefore, going on to point three, um, it's just a recognition of multiple learning models and environments. <clears throat> and uh, Leonie Scott Weber uh, from the field of environmental behavior was particularly insightful talking about these models um, of course, delivering uh, is, is very common. Um, that's where in, information is imparted in a relatively formal way so that others may gather it and may uh, receive it and learn from it. Applying knowledge is a method that's common in architectural studies especially. Uh, that's where the knowledge that students acquire is immediately put into practice. Uh, it can be using uh, um, laser cutters, different machines, it can be testing out hypotheses, and it can be design-build. Uh, creating knowledge is one step further. It often is multi or cross-disciplinary. It can be leaderless. It recognizes need and creating strategies or ideas um, um, uh, to respond to those needs. And environments for communicating knowledge, uh, uh, communication certainly has evolved in the past decades. And communicating knowledge no longer is as I am today speaking to you or with you, uh, but it happens in many, many places and on many platforms. And finally, uh, the fifth way uh, in this basic scheme of where uh, and what types of uh, learning models and environments do we have today at the university level um, is decision making. And again, the platforms for this could be online, it could be digital, they could be face to face. And the important thing is that information is distilled, judgments are made, and then actions are taken. And finally, the, the fourth point that I would like to make this morning has to do about blended lives and blended education. And 
what I mean by that uh, is that um, uh, in the past, uh, in in the past decades, we all are using um, um, digital technology in a variety of ways in our lives. We like to swim digitally, if you will, but often when we teach, we still follow a very romantic studio concept in the field of architecture. So the last point I would like to just share with you a little experience from IE. Um, uh, university and business school in Madrid uh, and our experience in trying to blend the digital world and the real world or the physical world. Um, for those of you who don't know it, uh, um, IE School of Architecture is the daughter of IE Business School. Um, this uh, business school was started 45 years ago uh, it is truly international because the vast uh, majority of our classes are taught in English. We have 93 nationalities represented in our students and faculty. Um, 80 was last year, or two years ago, 93 is this year. Um, it is a well-recognized business school. The Economist uh, ranked it number one in, uh, in the executive MBA program in the world and number one in online business uh, teaching by Forbes. There are 33 different programs and it is, uh, as you can see in the image of the students, uh, we base a lot of our efforts on collaborative and entrepreneurial work rather than traditional uh, classroom learning. The School of Architecture is, um, well, I have an argument with uh, my dean. Uh, he says it's a baby school. I say we're adolescents, or at least pre-teens now. The architecture school is four years old. Our emphasis is on connections uh, across disciplines um, and connections among people. It's integrated because we try to combine um, different methods of teaching and learning, and especially the internship is a very uh, integral part of our uh, undergraduate program. The pillars of the architecture school are design, innovation, and management. So, um, of course, as I mentioned, uh, we, we all have blended lives. We don't learn in one way, in one place. We don't use one uh, type of technology. Um, we use many, many things in many different, uh, in different ways. But if we look back, uh, if we look back to a year such as 1992, uh, we can see that maybe 10, only 10% 10 of our time was spent with the computer or the telephone. Uh, communicating in rather traditional ways. Today, probably about half the time, or some of us even more, are connected. So what does this mean for education? Well, of course there's a lot of skepticism, and when people think about online or e-learning, um, back in uh, 2002 as a benchmark, um, in, in many places, uh, and also at IE in the business school, um, e-learning was very small, a large component was face-to-face. -face. Um, it was seen as something very negative, where people would sit at a computer or watch a television screen on their own, isolated, and then tick off boxes in the answers uh, to exams. However, nowadays, um, e-learning is much more uh, sophisticated. It is, um, um, it, it's based on the individual. There's a lot of interactive communication. It can be customized. And I would say uh, it's necessary um, because we live in a digital world. We live blended lives. And if um, nothing else, it's unavoidable. It is the present and certainly will be the way of the future. Um, so
So again, going back to a benchmark like 1992, usually courses were 100% face-to-face or 100% online. Uh, nowadays, in our undergraduate program, we have about 70%, 75% face-to-face, 25% online, and the graduate program just the opposite. So why did we do this? Well, there are enormous advantages to um, online learning. Um, and the best, in program, the best programs employ technology to promote, to promote interactive group-based learning, not only in the classroom, but also online. And it is, the goal is for seamless collaboration and constantly challenging um, challenging matters and challenging uh, assignments, problems. The, there are about six or seven reasons that I can list. Um, online learning or e-learning suits busy schedules. You don't all have to gather at one specific time uh, in a geographic location. It can be just as rigorous and at times even more so than traditional uh, physical classroom learning. It gives everyone an equal chance to participate. Uh, usually in the classroom, I don't know in your experience, but mine, um, some people are often sit in the back and don't speak. Uh, today we'll see some people ask uh, questions, uh, uh, probably the same people have more than one question, and other, others of you may not ask any, any question at all. Um, it allows classes to be global instantly. You don't have to wait for people to come in by plane to a place, but you can connect globally instantly. Um, it's collaborative. Um, at IE, we do a lot of group work online, and it keeps up the momentum uh, better than in classes that meet three times a week or once a week, and it fosters a lot of respect and team building uh, over over the, the distance. And how is this done? Well, there are of course many, many different models, but I would say it, it always depends on three uh, aspects. It depends on the technology, it depends on your pedagogical model, but of course it depends on the people. Um, yeah. E-learning has to, it's, it's a huge investment, especially a huge investment in professors. Um, they have to be willing, they have to want to do this, they have to be willing to devote the time to be trained. They also are instrumental in developing the materials that are used uh, for e-learning. Um, these are just some figures that um, we, we ask our students how they feel about different courses and uh, the parameters that we use, we always have a small student to faculty uh, ratio. Um, and um, the, the amazing thing is that the vast majority of people complete the program and complete whatever program we offer very successfully. To give you an idea of some of the tools, and there are a variety, we have a, a, what we call Campus Online, and this is basically a platform for communication um, um, from teacher to student, and also uh, students may also post information, assignments, exams, uh, all types of notices, exercises, bibliography, etc. Is, uh, is posted to our Campus Online. Um, we also work with the case study model, especially at the business school, but also in architecture. And these are multimedia programs that are developed um, by us at the school. Um, and it gives all sorts of background information that students may need um, in a variety of models from videos, interviews, uh, texts, um, whatever type of information uh, is available over the internet, uh, whatever formats are combined, and we use them to make case studies that form the basis for learning. Um, students are then able to access this, and anyone is able to access our learning materials for free uh, from the internet. We also do gaming simulation, 
and that's a very popular um, uh, tool that's used in teaching, uh, especially in architecture. We have exercises that illustrate uh, uh, through movement different concepts. In this case, this has to do with uh, construction. And then we have uh, video conferences, uh, such as you can see a screenshot here. The professor is up in the left-hand corner. Uh, it uh, is someone making a presentation in the main screen. And down the left-hand column are the comments in real time uh, of all the students in that group that are watching it. And just to give you uh, two examples, uh, in our undergraduate program, our, our students study uh, in Segovia um, uh, for five years. It's a five-year program. But second, third, and fourth year, they are um, undertaking internships half-time and studying online the other half-time. Um, Segovia is a lovely city, but you wouldn't want to be there probably five years. So it's an opportunity for them to go throughout the world. Um, and what we try to do there is um, we have um, two years, uh, 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 they study and gain two years real world experience. And in terms of our postgraduate, they study while they work, so they are able to work and then um, uh, have the benefit of education integrated into their work lives. So uh, just in as, as closing remarks, um, I just wanted to suggest that uh, in, re in going back to the first idea about the studio, while the traditional architecture studio may be a valid tool in some cases, I would suggest that one-to-one uh, -one interaction between students and teachers and students and students in the early phases is probably a good addition, as is peer review panels, relying on students to help each other. Uh, that could be face-to-face -face, or it could be blogging online. Um, another, a third alternative uh, as an, uh, to the traditional crit, sessions that are anonymous, no names at the pin-up session, uh, to relieve the anxiety and some of the uh, difficulty of the traditional crit. And then finally, the speed crit, which is sort of like speed dating, where you sit at a table and you have uh, one minute to explain your project, and then you go to the next person and explain it again. So that gives a chance to improve quickly over time. Um, the, the second uh, point, of course, is uh, that there's a lot of research going on in other fields. Uh, and I think in the architecture and architectural education uh, disciplines, we have a lot to learn from listening to our colleagues in other fields. And rather than using common sense approaches, um, we could really make better quality experiences for our students by applying the rigorous research that is going on. The third point, of course, is that learning occurs in a variety of ways, and therefore the richer and the more varied way that we can uh, create and use spaces, defined spaces but also residual spaces, would really support creativity and learning. And finally, uh, of course, um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, for me, the difference or the boundaries between real and virtual are fuzzy and are becoming fuzzier and fuzzier. Uh, so therefore, embracing the opportunities of both will remind us that uh, space really matters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, maybe again, two or three questions from the audience. This has been um, a talk with a lot of strong positions and a very analytic and, and, and summary of the various uh, aspects that we're dealing with as teachers in this field. Um, but who's first? Thanks for this very inspiring um, presentation. I'm, I'm wondering, um, I have two questions. Number one, 
uh, on the level of software and hardware, you said it's a big investment, etc. Would be very curious what are you using if you developed something or if this is a market product. Yeah. And on the other hand, which results out of this question is, if we're talking nowadays about the, the, the necessity of mass learning, uh, I would be curious of what are the capacities of how many people do you inspire um, uh, to uh, attend with that system and what, in what ways has this changed the tuition? Is this now, a, let's say, an offer where a first class education would be accessible also in price for a larger number of people? Uh, or because I, I think that a lot of talented young people out there, quality could certainly be delivered to more people. Is it also cheaper? That would be my question. Okay. Um, thank you for the questions. The, the, in, in terms of hardware and software, um, the hardware that's used are computers, laptops. Um, um, I'm not sure what the capacity of our servers, etc., is, but it, it's probably um, comparable to any other university, which is uh, the scale that we are. Um, we're a small university, a small business school. Between the university and business school, I would say we probably reach about 5,000 students, so it's not large. Uh, in terms of software, we have developed a lot of the software, but that's not necessary. I mean, there are a lot of packages on the market. There are a lot of places that it can be purchased. What does require the investment are uh, the didactic materials, having um, working in teams to develop the case studies, working in teams to prepare the material that will go online. Um, I think in the end it's probably not that much more expensive because usually each professor for, for example, for structures is preparing their own exercises, they're preparing their own bibliography, and if, they, if those professors work together and uh, prepare the didactic materials, Yes, we, we have to rely on uh, software engineers and uh, graphic designers or web designers to work with us, but it's an initial investment in, and you can use those materials over and over again. So I would say in the beginning it's more expensive, but you amortize it over the life of the material and you can share it much more widely. Um, the second question you had about cost. Um, um, we are a private university. We're much cheaper than Columbia, Harvard, Princeton. Um, um, it, it's, um, I would say that um, there is not a direct relationship by online expensive, face-to-face, -face, less expensive. I think that's an economic policy of an institution. And, um, um, and it has to do with um, public versus private university or grants. Um, I think public universities in Spain are not going in this direction because they have no incentive to do that. that that's, quite, that's quite true. So um, we don't teach face to face and then offer online for a plus. And all classes are blended. It's you, almost all classes are blended. Yeah. Um, can uh, I, I'm thinking about the aspect of business. Mm -hmm. uh, can you? Uh, is it possible to compare the education of, for architects to Columbia? As you, because you said it's we are cheaper than Columbia. So. Is there a similarity or can you compare this or is it a completely different way of education or of um, the, the contents? Um, no, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not trying to say that our classes are the same. Um, what I can tell you, uh, uh, architectural education in Spain is regulated uh, by the Spanish government. Uh, we are a fully accredited university uh, and a fully accredited architecture, professional architecture program. Um, and in that sense, we may be similar to uh, um, other professional programs throughout the world. Um, it's, right now, it's a five-year bachelor's, and the law is 
going to make it five plus one to be a licensed architect, but right now it, it is a, you are a licensed architect after five years today. Business, um, where as some schools add other courses, uh, you know, you have uh, your core courses and electives. Uh, we have two areas where we have, which are we call transversal. Uh, one is the humanities, and that everyone in all in, in all the disciplines are expected to take uh, humanities as part of their education. And business is another aspect that everyone, whether they're in communication or psychology, um, they, they also take uh, courses related to management and business. Um, I'd be very happy to talk about this with people because I'm not sure if you have the feeling I used to have that business and money is a dirty word and architects and artists shouldn't talk about it and they should just create. But knowing that the economic situation has such a devastating impact nowadays on architects, um, the ones that are business savvy and international have at least a little opportunity to do something otherwise. Most of them are doing nothing right now in Spain. Yeah. One last question, a quick question before we take a 15 minute break. We are going to have a bit late. So, um, one last question and a bit to make. Thank you, I thought that was uh, very interesting. I, um, I'm, uh, yeah, my question is, I think, similar to Annette's in the sense that um, I'm concerned about this blending uh, technique, if we should call it so, um, because I'm deeply concerned about the rendered image, uh, how it has completely uh, dematerialized the practice of architecture in many ways, and, and this model seems to kind of perhaps accelerate the digitalization of architectural practice. And so um, for someone who is continuously meeting students that are becoming less and less manual and less and less, uh, have less and less of the ability to draw and to consider space and how uh, computation is affecting those, those skills, um, how do you keep this in check with your model of, of I mean, what mediates let's say model making with the interface with the school because I think there's a distinct difference between teaching business and teaching architecture fundamentally you know? so mm -hmm. wondering what you think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with you that um, in, in any discipline using one tool for expression is, is obviously not the way to go. Um, our students do make models. We do have a lab, a physical lab, uh, and shop at the university. However, when they are in other places on their internships, for example, um, there is absolutely no requirement that they only render um, when they're finding modes of expression. One that they're using a lot nowadays, and I think in probably in a number of places, are videos. We saw it in the presentation, previous presentation. Um, so I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. The more tools they have to connect the hand and brain, the better for everybody. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for this first round. We take a 15 minute break and later we have a...